Amen. So that's why we're here. Genesis chapter 1. Appreciate you coming out this afternoon. Isn't it a nice day out there? Uh, Y'all pray for uh, Matthew and Paige and the children. Headed back to Iowa this afternoon. He's got to go to work tomorrow, so pray for him. They're going to be back. Hopefully, they said they're coming back for homecoming, but I'm going to try to get them to come down before then. Because I like them babies. Amen. Ain't grandchildren the best thing in the whole world? Yes, yes. I would disown all of my children if I keep their, if I keep their kids. Do what, Lynn? That's right. Yes, ma'am. All right, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Amen. And, uh, you know, again, I just, I want to encourage you, believe, believe what the Bible says. You know, science, science don't have, they don't have all the answers. And especially when they don't believe God or believe in God, then what they say about God's creation is not going to match what God says. I mean, God is, a, it's like, it would be like you telling uh, Thomas Edison that he made the light bulb wrong. Right? I mean, he made the light bulb and he made it, I mean, he did, he made all the mistakes trying to figure out how to do it until he finally figured out how to do it and then he got it right. So it'd be like somebody, you know, a hundred years later saying, he didn't make it, he didn't really make that that way. It's not really, he didn't really do it that way. He did it, it took him, you know, it took him six million years to figure that out. No, it didn't. So it's like telling God that he's wrong about what he made. And I believe the Bible. Amen. So now here's a here's a um what some people would say is a is a contradiction. Because we see in Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 that originally there was no light and God said let there be light and there was light. But we don't have a sun we don't have a moon. We have no stars until, not on day two, not on day three. It wasn't until day four that God made the sun, the moon, and the stars. So how could that be? Especially when you have, he created light. And then he's, we had evening and morning. And then another evening and another morning. And then another evening and another morning. Until day four when God put everything up in the heavens. So we know that if we look at the book of Revelation, we see then that the light that lighted the earth before the sun, moon, and the stars was God himself. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the light of the world. So that answers the question for me. Amen. Genesis chapter 1 verse 14 God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Now notice those four things. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a little bit after we pray. And let them be for lights, verse 15, in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, what's the sun? The lesser light to rule the night, that be the moon. And he made the stars also. And God did set them in the firmament of the heaven. Remember, the firmament is the expanse as big as outer space is. That's the firmament. Put them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night. And then to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So let's ask God for wisdom tonight as we look through this. Heavenly Father, thank you Lord for those that have gathered with us tonight. Both here and all the people online. Pray Lord you bless them tonight. Father, we thank you for some good things we heard. We thank you for Sister Linda being able to go home today. I pray that you'd bless her in her home. And Lord, continue to give her recovery. Father... I thank you for that. 
because when I saw her in the, in the ICU, I wasn't even sure that she was going to live. And Father, you did it again for her. You are a miracle-working God. So Father, I thank you for giving our dear sister Linda some new life. Pray God that you would continue to bless her recovery, help her to get back on her feet. And Father, I know she wants to be in your house with her brothers and sisters and her friends once again to give her testimony of how good you are. And I pray that you'd bless that, bless her family. And Father, we pray, dear God, that you bless our church. We thank you, Lord, for all the work that you do all over the world. We ask you, Lord, to bless our radio stations. Ask you, God, to bless the ministers that are in Kenya as they preach to their people. Lord, that you would bless them and give them light from your word. Father, may all the things that they heard this week say one thing to them. And that is, there's power in the Bible. And God, give them wisdom from your word. Give them wisdom, God, and grace and blessings from your word tonight. You Lord, give us understanding. Far above all the scientists, above all the measuring instruments, Father, give us wisdom and help us to believe, dear God, exactly how you made this universe. And Father, we love you and we thank you. It's beautiful. The stars and the moon and the sun and everything, God, that you made is absolutely glorious. And we worship you tonight because of that. So, Father, I pray, God, that you would just give us wisdom. Bless your church tonight. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Notice this when he said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. So God had set the sun to rule over the day. And as long as the sun's up, you know, we don't think about it, but even when the sun is up, the stars are still there. The stars don't go away. They're still up there in the sky. It's just that we can't, because the light of the sun is more glorious than light of the moon and the stars, we can't see it. And there's a purpose in that. And I'm going to try to get into some of that as we move through this. But then he, then he tells us that not only are they for day and for night, but they are also for, and he mentions four things here. Now this is, again, this is the, the nature of God. God works in patterns. Here we have day four, and God does four things here. They are for signs and seasons, and for days and for years. So let me ex explain a little bit of that, but some of you know this. My daddy, I've told this many times, my daddy used to get, his favorite book was a farmer's almanac. And he could grow, he could grow things. I mean, he could grow things. He grew every, everything we ate in the summertime, he grew. And he, he used to love to sit at the table and say, that slept in the garden last night. <laughs> whatever it was, it was, it was beans or it was tomatoes or cucumbers or whatever. That slept in the garden last night. <laughs> yes, dad, we know I picked it. Yep. Yeah, we picked it and we shelled it, but it slept in the garden last night. So anyway, but he was proud of that because my dad planted by the signs. He read that almanac and he knew the signs that were in that. He knew when planting seed. And dad used that. to. He would call me and say, crappie are spawning tomorrow, seven o'clock in the morning. Okay, dad, we go down to Lake Kincaid over in Illinois. And he knew right where they were. I mean, he just had that sense about him. I didn't get it from him. Okay. But he had it in him. I think his dad taught him that and so on. But that's how he always did it. So when God put the sun, the moon, and the stars up there, I want you to understand this. When God gave us the gift of time, measuring time, we measure time by the sun, the moon, and the stars. Everything that we do now... How we measure time, well, even if it's digital, it's still measured by the motions of the sun, the moon, and the stars. You know, the moon has its phases every 28 days. By the way, ladies, God gave you that same cycle. And it's named after 
the moon. That's why it's done that way. It's so it just matches. As the waxing and the waning takes place with the moon, so it does with a woman. There's a waxing and there's a waning. And God designed it that way. So we measure time by the sun. The sun is, is accurate. And in that almanac, they have it laid out exactly what time the sunlight is going to appear in the morning and exactly what time it's going to disappear in the evening. And they've calculated that out. They can do that now for a thousand years if they wanted to because the motions are regular. They are ordered and ordained by God and they never miss. They never do. So that's how come they do that. And so because of it, because, and I love it when I figure this out. I never did really understand this when I was in high school. Maybe they tried to teach it to me. I don't know. But I started looking into it, noticing that the sun not only rose east to west every day, but also rising from south to north to south again every year. That's where we get our four seasons from. The Tropic of Capricorn south of the equator, the equator, the Tropic of Cancer. Because on December, so what is it? December 30, December 21st, the sun, make sure I get this right now. It's, it's the shortest day, so it would be south of the equator, right? Am I getting that right? December 21st, winter solstice. Shortest day of the year because the sun is below the equator. And it casts its light, it casts a very short light on us north of the equator. So December 21st, it's down 23 and a half degrees below the equator. And then on March 21st, which is the first day of spring, the sun is exactly at high noon straight above the equator. That's where it is. They, they measure it every year. Same place, right at noon, exactly above the equator. Then, on June 21st, at exactly noon, the sun is directly 23 and a half degrees above the equator. And that's why it's hot for us in the summertime. Sun's up here. All right? And it, do, and it takes, and that's the... So then, by the time it goes back down... We're into September 21st, so it's directly above the equator again. That's the equinox. And on September 21st and, and March 21st, for us, there are 12 hours and 12 hours in the day. That's why the day and night is equal. And that's why it gets longer and or shorter after fall because it's setting lower down below the equator for us. And that's why down south in Australia and South America... When we're having summer, they're having winter. And then when we have winter, they're having summer. That's why it does that. And, and that is a regular pattern that it goes through every year. And on the same day, every year, at the exact time it's supposed to, it's right there. And we know that. God is a... You cannot tell me that that just happened by accident. You can't tell me that. You couldn't spin a ball a million times and make it fall into that same pattern that it does now. Yes, ma'am. And seven. Yeah. Absolutely. And why do we have seven days in our week? Man would, that's right, man would have picked ten. Ten's an easier, in fact, there was a time when, I can't remember who it was, Voltaire or somebody, tried to get a law passed to put 10 days in a week instead of 7. Because seven's hard to count when you start adding stuff up. 10's easier. It never worked. Se yeah, amen. Seven days in a week. Why? Because God put it that way. God made it that way. And, the, and you look at the gestation period of all kinds of creatures, multiples of seven. Gestation period of a woman, gestation period of a dog or a cat. Somebody show me that. It's all divided by seven. It's just that way because God designed it and it shows his signature, shows his perfection. But anyway, God gave us them these things 
Notice that he says for signs. One of the things that we know that we're going to see at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is signs. Signs where? In the heavens. We know that's going to happen. Okay? So all the way back in the beginning, just like Solomon said, the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. All the way back in the beginning, God is showing us the design for the future. Even though we don't know the day or the hour, God has it all measured out. Signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. Then he's talked about the great light, the two great lights, the, le the greater light and the lesser light. And we'll look at that as we move along. So what day four was, was a fulfillment of day one. When God said, four, remember the four words, let there be light. And there was light. So day four now is the fulfillment of God showing it. Now, if we look at it like this is how God saves somebody. Remember on day one, when God, when you, when God met you, when God made you in your old life, there was, you were void. Okay? But then the Spirit of God began to move in your life. And on day two, what God did was God divided you from Him. You realize you're not God. You realize that there is something higher than you that you're going to have to answer to one of these days. Day three is when the seeds come out. Day three is when God planted the seed of the word of God in your life. Somebody, somebody gave you scripture or you read a gospel track or you went to church and heard a sermon. But the seed of the word of God was planted in your life. And, and God has already said to you, let there be light. God is already working in your life. But as of now, you don't know where that light is or who that light is. It's just there. Day four. That's when the light comes on. When you know then who the light is. The light is Jesus Christ. And you know that now. Okay? Now, you're not, you're not quite there yet, but you're getting there because on day six, that's when God's going to make the new man out of you. But for right now, you now know that Jesus Christ is the light and he is shining a great big light into a place that you haven't had light in for a long time. It's the place where all those sins are. It's the place where you've been disobedient to God and now God is showing you that you're not right with him. And he's also showing you, because day four is when God really shows us time. God now shows you that you're running out of it. And one of these days, God's going to call time on you, and he's going to judge you. So you, you start to get all these things figured out. So this is the fulfillment of day one. Now turn to John chapter one. And this is what I'm talking about. Now, God is going to show you the source of the light. So John chapter one. Remember John 1, 1 starts out, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning of, with God. And then in verse 6, it says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. So this would be John the Baptist, who was the witness before Jesus. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the... Notice the word light is capitalized, capital L. Translators knew who that was. It was talking about Jesus. So the same came for a witness, bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. That's what I'm telling you. At some point, God shined the light on you to get you to believe. And you understood who that light was. He was not that light, meaning John. John was not the light. We don't follow John. But was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth Every man that cometh into the world. Now I want you to look in your Bible. Look at verse 7. The word light. Verse 8. The word light. It's twice. Verse 9. The word light. How many times? Four. Light. Light, light, light. Got you on that one. All you had to do is look up on the screen. I got it underlined four times. I mean, I'm trying to help you out here. I can lead them to water, God, but I don't know about them drinking. All right. But anyway, four times here. How many Gospels are there? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They all tell the same story. They all tell about the light of the world that came into this world to die for our sins, 
to show sinners that they could live in heaven forever. Amen? So that's, that's the meaning of that. that. The Son, then, represents Jesus Christ, the light of the world. All right? So, John chapter 8, verse 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. We know that to be Christ. We know that to be what he said. We know it to be the Bible. And in John chapter 9, verse 5, he said, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, think about this. So there's a time for every man that God gives them light. But God is showing us through that that there's a time when that light goes away. So, what's the meaning behind that? Paul said, behold, today is the day of salvation. So you get saved while it's day. You, follow, you, you choose to follow God. Have God forgive you all of your sins. Repent. You are born again. But you do that during the day. You do that while the light is shining. Because there's coming a time when the light's going out. I mean, think about in the days of Noah. What did God do? God covered the earth, covered the skies. No light. God closed the door on the ark and he's cutting off salvation for any... That door, that ark stayed open. The whole time Noah's building that ark, the invitation's there to anybody. Anybody. Could have got on that ark and been saved. And then seven days before the flood, God said, for yet seven days. And it wasn't Noah that shut the door of the ark. It was God himself. The Bible says that God shut the door of the ark. So there's a time for every man. And that's why he said in John 9, 5, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Sun's going to go down one of these days. And as, I'm afraid there's going to be a lot of people. That when that sun goes, number one, there's going to be a lot of people that will be glad that sun's gone down because they love darkness rather than light. But number two, a lot of people are then going to realize I had my chance and I didn't take it. So in Malachi chapter 4, he tells us that, but unto you that fear my name, unto you that fear my name, shall the sun of righteousness arise with healing in his wings and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. So to those of us who fear the name of the Lord, the sun of righteousness rises and shines the light of God's word on us. And it shows righteousness is how we live. It shows us the way to walk. It, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, the Bible says. So, so the sun of righteousness, Psalm 84, 11, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. Now I'm going to give you a little astronomy. Things that I know. The gravitational effect of the sun is what makes all the worlds go around. They, they follow the, the reason why the earth has that path where part of the time the day is long and part of the time is the day is short. It's because it falls into the orbit of the sun and the gravitational pull of the sun helps us out. Now... I don't, if you remember a few years ago, there was a comet. I can't remember what it was, but it was going to circle the sun. And when it came back around, it was supposed to come pretty close to the earth. Can't remember what the name of it was. If anybody, huh? No, wasn't hail bop. It was, I can't remember what it was several years ago. People made a big deal about it. Like. It was going to start the tribulation or there was a UFO really hiding in something. And they made up all these stories about it. Okay, And some people actually base prophecies on it, which never come to pass because I'll tell you what happened. See, that, that thing was going to come close to the earth. And some of them said, NASA's hiding it from us. It's really going to hit us and kill us all. So what, But what happened was when it got back around the sun, they noticed that it was busted all to pieces. What happened was getting in so close to the sun, the gravitational pull of the sun just pulled it to shreds and basically made it benign. Okay? And I was like, I'm going, see, it wasn't going to hit. You people are stupid. Okay? But look at your Bible. 
The Lord God is a sun and shield. We have no idea how many things, how many floating meteorites in space that God has protected this earth from because of the sun. Because the gravitational pull of the sun has kept it. I mean, look at the moon. The moon's got these big pock marks all in it. Why? Meteors hit it. Huh? Yeah, it got hit with asteroids. Yeah. Hail Bob? Was it? Okay, it's Hail Bob. All right, good deal. So, anyway, I mean, that would have happened, or came, we could have came close, but God protected this earth because of the sun. And that's what he's saying. The Lord, the Lord God is a sun and a shield. And he means exactly that. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. That means everything God does for you is going to be good for you. Whether you think so or not at the time. It's like getting a whipping. Your mom and dad know it's good for you, but you don't agree at the time. Okay? You're just going, oh, this is not good. But mom and dad know better. So no good thing will he withhold it from them that walk uprightly. And God does that. When, when God chooses to bless people, he protects them. He is the shield that we trust in. In Exodus chapter 34, look at this. So we have, we have, we're going to have two pictures from two places in the Bible. And remember, on day four, God said, I'm going to have a greater light and a lesser light. Now, I talked about this this morning in Sunday school a little bit. Because I showed you the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, you have Moses. Moses is a Bible type of Jesus Christ. Moses was the deliverer. He was the savior. He was the judge of Israel and he was the lawgiver. Jesus is the savior. He is the, 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 he's the one that frees us from bondage. And he's the one who comes and brings down from heaven God's covenant with mankind in the form of the New Testament. So in Exodus 34 verse 29, it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand. When he came down from the mount, Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone. Remember, he was in the presence of God. And God, in the previous chapter, is that story where Moses wants to see God. And God said, Moses, it'll kill you. My glory, you cannot stand. So Moses, stand here on the cleft of the rock and I'm going to cover your face. And when I remove my hand, then you'll be able to see my back parts. But my glory, you... And so think about this. The back of God was so glorious that the skin in Moses' face, when he comes down from Mount Sinai, is shining so bright. I, I would love to know the physics of that, how that worked. But literally, Moses' face glowed and according to scriptures, it was so bright, the Israelites made Moses put a veil over his face to protect them because they could not look at his face. It's like looking at the sun. Moses wist not the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, they were afraid to come nigh him. So, but that was, Mo and by the way, eventually... That glow faded away. Eventually it did. Moses didn't have it. And then Moses died. So, now we have the New Testament version of it. We have Jesus. Moses was not God's own son. Jesus was. It's a better covenant. A better law. A, a, from a better priest whose blood actually is eternal instead of just being the blood of a, a bull or a goat. His blood is everlasting and this covenant is everlasting. God intended for the old covenant to fade away, which is why we do not have those two tablets. You ever ask yourself, what happened to those two tablets of stone? Where did they go? They're not in a museum. The, the Jews don't have it. Last we saw, 
They were in the Ark of the Covenant. And in the days of Josiah, Josiah had the Ark of the Covenant. We know it then. But sometime between Josiah and Nebuchadnezzar coming and invading Jerusalem, that Ark disappeared. Because in Jeremiah, you have a list of every stick of furniture that they took out of the temple, including the spoons and the snuffers, the candle snuffers. There was no ark, there was no table of showbread, there was no candlestick. Nobody, nobody knows what happened to them. They're gone. And nobody's found them since then. Not even Steven Spielberg, okay? So anyway, those Ten Commandments, that with the very writing of God on them, God allowed them to go away, to not be found. Why? Because that covenant is null and void. It's a new covenant. So after six days, Matthew 17, Jesus take Peter, James, and John. So how many people do we have on that mountain? Nope. You got it wrong again. Peter, James, and John, and Jesus. That's four. And one of them's different. One of them's the Son of God. Bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and he was transfigured before them. His face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. I bet Peter was just shaking. Okay, he's ecstatic. And he doesn't really, I don't think he really knows what to say. Uh, let's build three tabernacles. And Peter calmed down. Okay, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud. I think God heard Peter and he's going he's gonna to put a stop to this because we're not building a tabernacle for Moses and Elijah. We're not worshiping Moses and Elijah. God came down while he yet spake. Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 14 words. 7 times 2. Okay. Now, that passage right there. Take your Bible. Turn to Second Peter. This is, this is something that Peter's trying to teach us. Because Peter wanted everybody to hear him on this issue. Peter's still alive and he writes this letter to whatever church. Um, and he wants them to know... Yes, I did. Yes, I remember the day I heard God's own voice say, this is my beloved son. I was there when I heard it. None of us were. None of the people that Peter wrote to, they, were, they weren't there. They didn't hear that. So here's what Peter's saying. Verse 17 of chapter 1, 2 Peter. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So he's talking about this day. Peter said, I was there. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. But look at what he said. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. In other words, okay, so you weren't there. However, you have now something better than me hearing the voice of God and telling you about it. You have the Bible. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a what? A light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star, which is the sun, which is Christ, arise in your heart. And this is where he tells us, no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, for prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men spake of God, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So he's telling you the inspiration of the scriptures. That God gave every word down to these men and they faithfully recorded it for us so that we could have the, what we could have what Peter said was better than hearing the voice of God on the mountain. Now you can hear the voice of God every day when you read your Bible. Amen. Second Corinthians. Turn there. Second Corinthians 3. This, this is I, I, part of, this kind of overlaps what I taught in Sunday school this morning. But it's pertinent here. 
Because it deals with the greater light and the lesser light. The sun's the greater light, the moon's the lesser light. When the moon is full, it's bright. Uh, I like to scare Lisa and the kids when they were little. On a full moon, I would turn the headlights off. Drive by the light of the moon. I learned that from my brother-in-law. Because when I was a kid and they were dating, he used to scare me to death. I went home and told mom. My sister got mad at me because I told mom because Gene was driving with the moonlight. <laughs> at least he wasn't driving with moonshine. Amen. It was just moonlight. All right. But I learned it from him. But that's, that's, that sun, when that sun comes up, that moon's gone. Now you think about that. The Old Testament had glory, had so much glory in it that Moses just shined. But all the Old Testament did, Lynn, was tell you what kind of sorry, low down, hell deserving, wicked sinner that you are. Because you broke God's law. You did what God told you not to do, which is why you come to church. Because we're sinners. Amen? So, look at it. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Eventually it faded away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? He's talking about the New Testament. Because think about it. At what point in the Old Testament did the Holy Ghost fall on all the nation of Israel? It didn't. You only see the Holy Ghost coming on certain people at certain time. But now in the New Testament, the Holy Ghost comes upon everybody. See, there's a difference already. So, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For the ministration of condemnation be glory, talking about the Old Testament... Much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. And what he's telling you is that compare the moon with the sun. When you look at the moon and, and it's bright and full and you go, man, that is beautiful. That's glorious. Until the sun comes up. Its glory has gone now because you got something better than that. For Verse 11, for if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech and not as Moses. Moses stammered. He was a stutterer. He, had, he was hard to understand. So the Jews, when they read the Old Testament, they don't understand it. They don't understand what they're reading. They're seeing Christ there, but they don't know it's Christ. It's a mystery to them. And not as Moses which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. I told you that that semester when I was in Bible college in Nashville, the college was actually in an old wealthy neighborhood. And there were a lot of rich Jews that lived in that because they had a temple. Just on the other side of the school campus. And on Saturday, we would watch those Jews walk to temple. And I'd ask some of the guys that had been schooled there longer, have you ever tried to talk to them? Yeah, I tried to talk to them. They don't talk. They don't, they don't look at you. You ever try to witness Jesus to them? Yeah, but they don't like that. They get mad. Okay? And that's what he's saying here. Their minds are blinded. They're reading that Old Testament. They have a reading of the Old Testament every time they go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. But they don't have a clue what it means. Because there's a veil. It's like reading a book through a veil. You don't understand it. You can't, you can't grasp it. So that's the Jews right now reading that Old Testament. They're, they're, it's like trying to read a book by moonlight. It's bright, but it's not that bright. So you won't understand it. What you need is the sunlight. Once you have the sunlight, then you can understand what it says. And the sun basically is the New Testament. So now, because we're Gentiles and we've been given the New Testament, 
We can read the Old Testament now and we can say, yeah, I understand that high priest. Yep, that high, that high priest that's in the law, that was Christ. Yeah, that lamb, I understand that lamb, that Passover lamb with that blood. God said, when I see the blood, yeah, we sing that all the time. We know what that means. That's the blood of Christ that atones. And when we, God sees the blood, he'll pass over us. See, we know all these things now because of the sunlight of the New Testament. But the Jews, they don't know it. So that passage goes on. And what it says is, um, let's see, where is it? Second Corinthians 3. It says, uh, verse 16. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. One of these days, God's going to lift that veil. And he said, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed in the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So one of these days, the veil is going to be lifted off Israel and they're going to see the word. Of, they're going to see the Messiah. They're going to see that it's Jesus. It's not one of their Jewish rabbis. It's not one of their they're famous Jewish sages from days gone by. It's not Moses. It's not Elijah. It's Jesus Christ, the one that they had crucified. Uh, let me finish with this very quickly. Numbers 24, 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. So it's even prophesied. Notice the capital S. The star out of Jacob. And a scepter shall rise out of Israel, shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. So we look at that now and we know who that is. The Jews read it. They had no idea. Second Peter 1. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Revelation twenty two sixteen. I have sent. I Jesus have sent mine angel to testify unto you. That these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. The bright and morning star. That's what he says. And that morning star is not Venus. It's not the planet Venus. The bright and morning star is the sun. So here's here. This is interesting. Science in the last hundred years tells us that our sun is basically a star. If you go to some other star system and look at our solar system, you won't see a sun. You'll see a star just like all the other stars. How did they know that? Because that is exactly what God says here in the Bible. That the sun is essentially a star in the sky. And that's what all those other little lights are up there. They're little suns, or actually some of them are big. Suns over their own little system deal. So once again, science scratches his head. It figures something out and says, look at this. We're smart. We're smarter than all you religious people. But it was there in the Bible now for... Some 3,000 years. Somebody say amen. Amen. Well, aren't you glad the light shines on you? Amen. Uh, boy, I, li I got some more. I got some more of this. See that picture right there? That exact picture is in the Bible. That ex what you're seeing right there is it, with the exception of Pluto, Pluto's not a planet anymore, which it shouldn't be. And I'll show you why. But that the, exactly the way that depiction is of our solar system is in the Bible. And I'll read it to you word for word. But you got to come church next Sunday night. Because <laughs> I'll just be mean enough not stream it. All right. I'm. When I saw it, I went, oh, that's it. It says it, yeah, it's pretty cool. All right, let's stand to our feet.